it's also unusual for the Justice Department, after already getting a guilty plea, to say we're dropping the charges. Oh, no, actually it's not. Guilty pleas had to be withdrawn in several of Andrew Weissman's cases back in the Enron Task Force days, including uh, Richard Cal uh, Christopher Calger and Arthur Anderson partner David Duncan, who had even testified against Arthur Anderson. I mean, Weissman and his compadres have a gift for bludgeoning people into pleading guilty to things that aren't crimes. And we also attached to our petition, or, or our filing in Judge Sullivan's court, I don't remember which, three instances of guilty pleas that were withdrawn and uh, the convictions vacated on motion of the United States, uh, the sure. Attorney General Eric Holder in uh, the D.C. courts just a few years ago. A few years ago, but is that happens, something... It, Go ahead. It, it happens with, some, with fa unfortunate fair amount of regularity and probably should happen even more than it does because if you look at Jed Rakoff's article, Why the Innocent Plead Guilty, from right. 2014, he's a Clinton appointee. Unfortunately, innocent people are compelled by the conviction machine on which Harvey Silverglade and I just wrote a new book to plead guilty frequently. It happens I hear you. far too often. On the question of why the innocent would plead guilty, David Ignatius, who wrote the column in the Washington Post that started all this about General Flynn's conversation with the Russian ambassador, he had a column earlier this month saying, it's useful to go back to a basic question. If Flynn did nothing wrong when he called the Russian ambassador in December of 2016, as you know, the day President Obama imposed sanctions on Russia for interfering in the presidential election of 2016, why did he conceal it? How do you answer that question as attorney? If there was nothing wrong, why didn't he tell the truth? He did tell the truth. It's the FBI agents who made up the lies in the 302. They added things that weren't supported by their notes. They did not write down things he did say. They completely manufactured the purported case against him. They but, manufactured the, quote, false, Ferris statements. The general was honest with the FBI agents when they interviewed him. Did he remember every word that was said on the phone call? No. Who does? Right. But so he just was honest with them, and they knew it, and they came back and briefed three different hour-long sessions of the upper echelon of the FBI and the DOJ on that right. very fact. But, Sidney, you know that in his February 2017 resignation letter, he admitted that he had given, quote, unquote, incomplete information to the vice president when asked about it. So no matter how you phrase it, just as a last question, why did he even say in that resignation letter that he had not given complete information? Well, like I said, he may not have reported everything that was said, but a lie requires intent to deceive. And there was absolutely none of that as the FBI agents themselves admitted in writing, in their notes and otherwise, and in their briefing in their 302 uh, several months later also. A 302, and, and that's what which, they briefed everybody on. A 302 form about the interview with General Flynn that apparently the FBI can't find, which is yet another question about what really happened here. Last thought? There are so many questions about what happened here. The government is still hiding evidence. Obviously, Christopher Wray has finally started an investigation of this inside the FBI, which should have happened years ago. They've been hiding the evidence that shows he's innocent for three years and the fact that they yeah. made it up all along. Sydney Powell, we certainly appreciate your insights tonight on a case that keeps getting stranger. Thank you, Sydney.